welcome, everybody. Sincere welcome. And I feel the very first thing I have to do this year is to express sincere congr congratulations to the committee and to everybody involved here in Mellory. I see from the program that not merely have you got the parish priest coming to celebrate Mass during the week, but you also have Bishop Cullinan coming to uh, wrap up the, the ceremonies at the end of the week, at the end of the anniversary. Mm. That is a great step forward. And it would not have taken place if it wasn't that you had a sound committee. So my very first words today have to be congratulations to everybody involved with Mallory Grotto. You may recall, <clears throat> oh, that was so a strong girl. You may recall that our Blessed Mother asked the children to spread the messages. And you may also recall that the children asked back, well, how were we to spread the messages? Can you remember what our Blessed Mother said? You have ways yourselves. Now, as it happens, the one way in which I have of spreading the message is, well, two ways. One is the curate's diary, and the other is the YouTube. And two years ago, when I was here, I gave a commentary on the entire set of messages and um, published it on YouTube. And so far, there have been 32,000 uh, hits on it. So today I'm again going to record video, some of what I will be doing here today, again with the hope that by loading it to YouTube, that it will again help to spread the messages. There were young children, so the way our Blessed Mother spoke to them, she spoke to them in their own sort of language. And so it may not be the most theological uh, language, but it's simple language that young boys would understand. And the boys claimed that Our Lady said several times. What did she say several times? The world must improve. She also said, if people would improve and pray, God would save Ireland. But the people must pray more. The people must go to Mass more. Well, have they been going to Mass more? I haven't seen signs of it, have you? The people must go to Mass more and receive my son more often. I want the people to believe. The world has 10 years in which to improve. That was in 1985. It must improve 10 times over. And then she repeated, the world must improve and the world must believe. If the world does not improve, what would happen? The devil would take over the church. It's not frightening. Because the world here in Ireland certainly has not improved. And have we in some ways seen the devil taking over the church in the broader sense of the word? A little bit every year, a little bit at a time, that gradually the church has been losing its grip and the world and who does the world represent, has been taken over. That was in 1985. Very interestingly, in 1976, a cardinal called Carol Wathila, does that name sound familiar, yes. who became Pope in 1978, he was visiting in America, and it is recorded that he went around to the Polish community in America, and heard the problems of the Polish community and was talking about the problems of the Polish community. And then on the final night, he said to them, we have to put it this way, because we are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has gone through. I do not think that wide circles of the American society or wide circles of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation 
between the church and the anti-church, of the gospel versus the anti-gospel. Then he added, this confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It is a trial which the whole church and the Polish church in particular must take up. It is a trial of not only our own nation and church, but in a sense a test of 2,000 years culture and Christian civilization, with all of its consequences for human dignity, individual rights, human rights, and the rights of nations. So Pope, the future Pope said that six years before the Mallory apparitions. And isn't that very significant? And two years after he became Pope, he said something very similar in an interview in Germany. Now I haven't time today to give you the full of what he said in America or the full of what he said in Germany, but if you get the September issue of the Curate's Diary, which will be published within the next week or so, you will be able to see the full text, uh, or a fuller text, of what he said on both occasions. But also in Limerick, anybody, any recollection of what Pope John Paul said in Limerick in 1979? He said, Ireland must choose. There is a choice facing Ireland. And Ireland is going to have to make a choice between the, the right way and the way of the world. He said, will it be for the transformation of all strata of humanity into a new creation? Or the way that many nations have gone, giving excessive importance to economic growth and material possessions while neglecting the things of the spirit. The way of substituting a new ethic of temporal enjoyment for the law of God. The way of false freedom, which is only slavery to decadence. And he repeated several times, Ireland must choose. You, the present generation of Ireland people, must decide. Your choice needs to be clear and your decision firm. Now, has Ireland decided? Or has it drifted? I think Ireland has drifted. And drifted very badly. Again, if you want to see more of what Pope John Paul said in Limerick, the September issue of the Curate's Diary will contain it. Pope John Paul was also very instrumental in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And there is one passage in it which I suspect that most of you have never heard of, but which again is very prophetic and which I suspect uh, Pope John Paul was the instrument of getting it into the, uh, the catechism. He's, it says, before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the fate of many believers. Has the fate of many believers been shaken? The persecution that accompanies our pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering people an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pursuit of messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come into flesh. Again, that will be quoted in the September issue of the Curate's Diary. Well, if you wish to look it up in the Catechism, it's number 675 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But note the phrase, a religious deception offering man an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Are we not seeing signs of that today? Think of how the word sin has been removed from the vocabulary. Think of how even there's a denial of the reality of hell. You find a churchman after a churchman of very, very high rank, either saying or implying that hell does not exist, or else if it does exist, nobody's going there. Have you come across that? Sadly, it's there. Well, I have a couple of questions about that. 
If that is the reality, did Jesus not know what he was talking about when he warned again and again of the reality of hell and the danger of going there? Did Jesus not know what he was talking about? And if we accept that Jesus knew what he was talking about, then do we have to not accept that maybe some of these high-ranking clerics of the present era, that they're the ones who don't know what they're talking about? The two can't be right. Jesus effectively warned of the dangers of hell with exactly the same vigor and with exactly the same sort of imagery as the mother and road safety authority warns of the dangers of drink driving and ex excessive speed while driving. He used all the imagery of the day to warn of the reality of hell and to warn people to make a choice uh, for uh, the, the eternal kingdom. Of course, the good news is you needn't be worried about hell yourselves if you have made a choice for Christ. Let us be very clear about that. Those who make a choice for Jesus Christ and for his kingdom have absolutely no need to worry about hell. Now, there are people out there, I suspect, who have good need to worry about hell. I don't really believe I'm going to end up in the same place as Vladimir Putin. Do you believe you'll end up in the same place as Vladimir Putin? I don't believe I will. And those who, uh, who are around him and supporting. There are people out there who are making extremely bad choices. Now, some of them may be forgiven because they don't realize what they're doing. I haven't planned to speak about this today, but... Uh, I'm going off a tangent now from my program. My apologies if I offend anybody by so doing. But within certain realms of our own Catholic Church, on the extreme right of our own Catholic Church, have we not got people who believe that there's an elite out there who are going to control us and that who are warning us continuously, and the warning about the wearing of face masks, the warning about the vaccines, the warning about the lockdowns, that this was this elite that was uh, going to, uh, desiring to control us. Have you come across that? And guess what? In America, uh, there last week, it turns out that in America, same group had managed to convince the millions of people in America that the massacres at Sandy Hook and various other places didn't take place. And they were sued for it. Their leader was sued for a bloke called Alex Jones. And guess what? From the evidence that came out in court, it turns out that Alex Jones was drawing in approximately perhaps 200 million a year from the promote, promotion of these conspiracy theories. Shouldn't that give people a, a, a reason to pause and to think? And in America, he had managed to convince people that the Sandy Hook massacre and the various other massacres were really didn't happen, that they were staged by actors to, to, in order to bring in gun control on behalf of this world elite. What is the essential difference between that and here in Ireland, uh, the same claim that wearing face masks was this world elite uh, trying to control us and this uh, subsidiary lies that went with that, that face masks was, were going to destroy our brain and destroy our teeth and all sorts of things. So, sorry, I hadn't planned to go in that direction. But it's, 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 it's something to be thought about. These conspiracy theories, there are people behind them raking in the millions, billions and um, Alex Jones, um, for that particular case, he was um, the, the family that sued him were awarded 4.1 million, and then a further 25 million in punitive damages. But uh, alerting us that there are forces out there who are starting these conspiracy theories and making big money out of doing so. However, I've gone off all over the place. My apologies. And coming back to the present. We have a choice to make. Are we going to choose for Jesus and for his kingdom? That is the choice before us. Are we going to stand for Jesus and for his kingdom? 
To my mind, it's almost like as if a cloud, a veil of darkness have come upon people. It's as if a veil of disbelief, of indifference to the fate has come upon so many people. We see it in our churches. And this again is part of the great confrontation that uh, Pope John Paul uh, prophesied would take place where people are drifting from the fate, uh, being led away from the fate, and choosing the world over the fate. And just looking ahead to next year's synod in Rome, we can only pray that next year's synod, it has a choice facing it. There are people within the church. Remember our Blessed Mother warned that the evil one would take over the church in 10 years. There are people within the church who have embraced the world and the teaching of the world. And there's going to be a great choice, almost confrontation, coming up to the Synod of Bishops next year. Which will the church listen to the voice of God or which will the church listen to the voice of the world? That is the choice facing, the, facing our church. And we can only pray that by some great miracle that it will embrace the teaching of Jesus Christ and reject the teaching of the word. And for that we pray earnestly here today as we will also be praying earnestly in the rosaries for peace in the word. But let us now turn to Jesus. I invite you to turn to Jesus And to repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I do love you. And I desire to love you with all my mind, with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my strength. Lord Jesus, I decide for you and for your kingdom. And I pray for the grace to give faithful witness to you in the world and to inspire people to turn to you and to accept your teaching as the way, the truth, and the life. And I will now bring the Blessed Sacrament around in blessing.